I want to tell you about myself. My name you know, it has been said. I got born again in 1989 uh, when I was in high school. Before I got born again, I was religious. My mother uh, uh, taught me about religion and I was raised from a Catholic background. My mother loved me very much. Out of the 10 children, she used to walk with me right from age six. I remember I used to hold her dress. She takes me to church. She, she sits with me. She was um, a singer in the church. She was a musician. And I learned how to pray, uh, to play tambourine. I went through all the Catholic, uh, they call them sacraments. And I remember when I was age eight, I went through what Catholic call confirmation. And during that time, when I was confirmed, I, I had something came to me, something filled me like the glory. It was the glory of God, actually. And at that age, I could not explain myself. I just felt as if I have completely been changed. And I continued in that faith until when I joined high school. And one day we had, uh, it was on 6th of August, 1989, I was in Form 4. Uh, we had a weekend challenge. And before the weekend challenge, I think we told ourselves, I was the school head girl. And I used to, I was a mobilizer. I had so many friends. So the top friend, the friends, those ones very near me, we told each other, eh, these people who are telling us they are coming to challenge us. You know, from force when you are just about to do exams, how naughty students can be in school. You say, these people who are coming to challenge us, we are the ones who will challenge them. Those days we didn't have, uh, okay, we had some lip lipstick, but it was not very common, but we knew about it. So we, we took red pens, blue pens, we painted our lips, and we painted our fingers, and we said, we are going to challenge these men. If they are men who are coming, we are the ones who are going to challenge them. And we were a group. So we went and sat behind. We used to sit in an amphitheater. My, 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 the, the, my school um, was a missionary uh, school, Goibei Girls High School. Um, a Pentecostal missionary school. So they had made for us an amphitheater where we used to sit. So we went right behind. So the preacher started, first of all, the preacher started with a song. And they were, this song, the, the preacher was a young man playing a guitar. This song was saying, um, Yesu anapenda was chana. Yesu, anapenda wa toto. So that song really touched me. That song really touched me. Then the preacher went to preach. And uh, when they were, the, the preacher was preaching. After preaching, he started prophesy, prophesying. And he said, there is a girl here. This girl is having a boyfriend. And if she will not drop that boyfriend, she will be in trouble. I don't know how I somersaulted up to the preacher's feet and I was screaming. I was prayed for among many other girls and I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Amen, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, but before I got born again in that uh, 1989, in 1987, my career dream, I wanted to be a chaplain. So when the teacher came asking, what will you like to be when you grow up, girls? So mine I wrote, I want to be a chaplain. So my friends came and looked, you want to be a chaplain? I said, yes. Do you know what a chaplain means? I said, no, I don't know, but me, I just want to be a chaplain. So they told me, you mean you want to be a pastor? I said, well, what is wrong? I want to be a pastor. And you have a boyfriend. That was a year before I got born again. So after that, I really cried in the whole compound. I was crying. We went for lunch. The power of God was 
great on me and the preachers who had come to preach to us. You know, when they noticed that it is the school head girl who has gotten born again, they were really interested in me. So they called me and they were asking me uh, about my family, how I grew up. And about for about 13 years, I had not eaten meat. In high school, when other girls were eating meat, I used to eat ugali with gideri because we didn't have special meals. So I told them uh, I have not been eating meat because when I eat meat, my body, uh, there, there are some reactions on my skin. So they told me, do you have faith will eat meat today now that Christ has saved you? I said, yes. They prayed for me, bought meat, um, and they gave it to me and I ate after 13 years. And I didn't have any reaction. Amen. And that is what God did. After that, when, I, uh, when we finished exams, I went back at home. Of course, my mom was raising me to be a nun. So I went, the first person I met, it is her. I told her, I'm born again. So she was asking me, what is being born again? I told her, I have received Jesus as my personal savior. And I told my mom, you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior also. Then I told her, on top of that, I have eaten meat. So that one excited my mom very much. She was so happy. She, she asked me, if I buy meat and cook, you will eat. I said, yes. She bought meat, brought, I ate, and there was no reaction. So my mom believed in my salvation. And I right there, I started evangelizing. I told her, mom, you should stop reading, you are praying using the rosary because you will go to hell. And me and my mom, we were very close. She taught me how to pray. At that early age, I knew how to pray. I used to wake up early. When she wakes up, she wakes me up. Before I go to sleep, we used to sit with my brothers and sisters. Then when they doze, they were not punished. But for me, I was punished for dozing when we are praying. Because she knew she, she was raising a servant of God, a nun. So I knew to pray at that early age. Then from there... I moved into the community. I told all other young people, my friends, I told them that me, I'm born again. If you want to be my friend, you must be born again. But I, I didn't want to, to disappoint my mom uh, by joining another church. I continued to go to Catholic. What I used to do, I used to go in the first service, then I get out of there, then I go uh, to the fellowship. So... One time, I, I found friends there, uh, girls who are in boarding school who are also born again at school. So we were three. And in the fellowship, we had other young people. And we, we were telling these other young people, have you received Jesus Christ? They were asking us, what is that you are telling us? We tell them, you need to receive Jesus Christ. Catholic will not take you to heaven. So we convinced many uh, young people in the church and they started following us to the fellowship. And one day the catechist stood in front of the church and they told us, they announced in the church that there are some young people here who have become rebellious. They are telling other young people that they are born again and they are snatching young people from this church, taking them to fellowship because we used to go to fellowship. Then they ordered our parents never to allow us go to Catholic church again. So we said we will not go there, but we will continue going in the fellowship because that fellowship was a fellowship of very many young people in the village who are going, getting born again from school and they don't have anywhere to go. So we had our very, very fiery koinonia. So we used to go in this koinonia. We go there, we read the word of God, we sing, we testify, and we do everything that we could do, then we go back at home. So my dad, I had fear to testify to my dad because I knew the consequences. He will not allow it. So uh, one time, we were doing crusades. So my dad, I don't know how he, 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 he was passing around and he saw me standing on, on a, a platform singing. And, so I didn't know that my dad has seen me. 
So when I went at home at around eight, my dad just came. I was standing near my mother and he picked, picked my ear. You girl, where are you from? I have seen you on a tree. Then I said a tree. Then he pinked me and I managed to flip out of his hand. I went to the house of my brother. My brother was asking, what is wrong with you? You'll be beaten. You are said not eating, you are struggling. You, you, why? Stop these things. Then I told myself, whom will I obey? Will I obey God or I obey man? So I continued that way in that koinonia. That is what built me. That is what made me the fellowship of brethren. And that is how I grew up. And after the results came, I was to go to college. And they took me to nursing. And that nursing, I could not stay there. Because of climatical changes, it was a very cold place. Finally, I went to Bible school and did my theological studies at Nyangori Pentecostal Bible College. And I continued preaching the gospel. Now, over 30 years, I can't regret why I got born again. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Our God is so faithful. He's so good. You are here. You are a young girl. You've just gotten born again or a young man or you are even old. Don't you worry. The Lord will see you through. We want to uh, go through another case study in the Bible. And this is a case study of Apostle Paul uh, from the book of um, from the book of uh, uh, Acts chapter 26 and verse 12 to 9. And the topic is a call to, to go. A call to, to go. So I'll read the scripture and then we will continue. Acts chapter 26, verse 12 to 19. The Bible says, on one, on one of the, these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, about noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the gods. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have, ap I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan uh, to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then... King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Yeah. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient uh, of the vision from heaven. Amen. That is uh, uh, Paul's uh, defense. That is Paul's defense before uh, King Agrippa and Festus. When Paul got born again, he immediately, he immediately started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one time when he was preaching in the temple, those people, the Judaism, Paul was preaching among the Judaizers. The Judaizers, when they heard Paul preaching about Jesus Christ, the son of God, they were not happy. So they arrested Paul and they took him, uh, they wanted to kill him, but they took him to, uh, to, 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 to King Ag Agrippa to go and defend himself. So Paul uh, defended his faith 
in that book of scripture, uh, Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 16 to 19, we have seen what he has been telling King Agrippa. It is a long story. If you want to read Paul's conversion, you can read Acts chapter 9. So what Paul said is this. One, he said, I saw a light. That is from verse 12 to 13. Apart from Jerusalem, Paul had asked for authority to visit the synagogues in distant cities. His zeal had driven out many of believers and they had taken their message to Jews in other communities. Paul persecuted Christians. This man was a Judaizer. He's a man who had studied the law and Judaizers were not accepting any other religion apart from their religion. So Paul, when he realized that there are so many Christians, they are having their fellowships, having their koinonia, they are preaching around, he started, uh, 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 he started persecuting them, arresting them, taking them to prison, murdering them. And at this point in time, he had just participated in the killing of Stephen. So Paul considered himself an enlightened man, for after, after all, he was a Jew and a scholar and a Pharisee. In reality, Paul had lived in gross spiritual darkness. He knew the law in his pre-conversion days, but he had not realized that the purpose of the law was to bring him to Christ. If you read Galatians 3, 23, he says, the law was just to point uh, uh, people to Christ, and it was not saving people. He had been self-righteous Pharisee who needed to discover that his, his good works and res respectable character could never save and take him to heaven. This man who was persecuting believers, he had self-confidence in himself because he had studied the law and he knew through the study of the law and through persecuting believers, he thought he had found the way. And that is not actually what had happened. If we read in, uh, in the book of uh, Philippians chapter 3, I'll read very fast. Philippians chapter 3. And verse 7 to 11, he says, he, he confesses that no confidence in the flesh. This is a church that Paul had planted and he's writing to them the letter. He's telling them that there is no confidence in the flesh. He says, but whatever was to my profit, I now count loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared um, uh, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost uh, all uh, gain. Okay. Uh, let me repeat. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This Paul who was persecuting and killing people because they were preaching a Christianity, he got born again. He had self-righteousness and self-righteousness you can only have it in flesh because the law was operating in flesh. He knew the law but he didn't know that Jesus Christ was was God, was surpassing, he was above the law and now um, Jesus Christ, because he was now persecuting uh, Christians, Jesus met him. The light Paul saw was supernatural, for it was 
the glory of God revealed from heaven. When Stephen was stoned, when he was about to die, heaven, heavens opened and Stephen saw the glory of God. And this is the light that shone uh, to Paul when he was going to Damascus to kill Christians. It actually had blinded Paul for three days. For three days, Paul was blind when he met Jesus. But his spiritual eyes had been opened to behold the living Christ. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 6, his spiritual eyes were opened and he saw the living Christ. Though his physical eyes were blind, but his spiritual eyes were now opened. He started seeing things in a spiritual way. But seeing a light was not enough. He also had had to hear uh, the word of God. I heard a voice. That is verse 14 to 18. That is what Paul is continuing to uh, tell King Agrippa. Paul's companions had seen the light, but not the Lord. And they had heard a sound, but they could not understand the words. They all fell to the earth, but only Paul remained there. Jesus Christ spoke to Paul in the familiar Aramaic tongue of the Jews. Call, call him by name and told him it was futile for him to continue fighting the Lord. Jesus called Paul by name. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. The other Saturday, our senior pastor was telling us that God calls us by our names, but the devil calls us by our actions. So call, God was uh, calling Paul by his name. At that time, he was Saul. In that moment, Paul had made two surprising discoveries. Jesus of Nazareth was alive. And he was so united to his people that their suffering was his suffering. Paul was persecuting not only the church, but also his Messiah. When we are persecuted here on earth, Jesus also feels it. That is why when Paul was going to Damascus to kill Christians, Jesus had to meet him on the way and let him know that he is a persecuting him, even as he continues to persecute uh, Christians. And what I liked in this uh, bit of scripture in Paul's defense, apolog apologetics, is when he says, I was not disobedient. Paul is telling King Agrippa what you have seen uh, being acted here. He was telling King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the call. That is verse 19 to 21. When Paul had asked, Lord, what will thou have me do? That is in Acts 9, 5 to 6. He meant it sincerely. And when the Lord told him, he obeyed orders immediately. He began right at Damascus and it almost cost him his life. When he was in Damascus, and he started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and even the Jews. The Jews who were there were not happy at all about uh, what Paul was saying. So they wanted to kill him. In spite of repeat, repeated discouragements and dangers, Paul had remained obedient to the call and the vision that Jesus Christ gave him. Nothing moved him. Immediately, Paul was converted. He went ahead and started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, both to the Gentiles and the Jews, without fear or prejudice. And he preached the gospel. In Acts 26, 21, Paul clearly explained to Agrippa and Festus what had really happened in the temple and why it had happened. It was on account of these things that Paul had been attacked and almost killed. These people wanted to kill him. His declaration that Jesus of Nazareth was alive and was Israel's Messiah 
His ministry to the Gentiles and his offer of God's covenant blessing to both Jews and Gentiles on the same term of repentance of faith. They wanted to kill him because the Judaizers, they didn't want to hear any other religion apart from uh, Judaism. And Paul had now come up with a new religion. He was now preaching Jesus Christ crucified. The proud, national, the proud nationalistic Israelites will have nothing to do with a Jew who treated Gentiles like Jews. Paul said, Jesus Christ has, has come for all, both the Gentiles and the Jews. That is what he declared. And this displeased the Jews. And they started plotting and wanting to kill him and took him before King Agrippa and Festus. And Paul started giving his defense uh, uh, why he was uh, preaching the gospel the way he was preaching. And he was saying he has seen the light and he has heard the voice of the Lord. And God has sent him, uh, the Jesus of Nazareth who resurrected has sent him to go and preach the gospel both to the Gentiles and the Jews. And for sure Paul went from one a region to another preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was now zealous not uh, to kill Christians but to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ both to the Gentiles and the Jews as he had been called. Uh, we have here, um, there is um, a, um, a chart that I, I found uh, very useful showing that his missionary journeys, the areas Paul went into. After his conversion, uh, uh, after his conversion, he went in Damascus and he stayed there for a while. Then after that, he went to Arabia. After that, he went back to Jerusalem and he went also to Tarsus and Syria and Sicilia. And as Paul moved in, in these regions, he was not only moving, but he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. After Sicilia, he came back to Antioch. He went back to Jerusalem. Uh, and we, ca we come now to his first missionary journey. And this was in Antioch. Uh, he preached in Antioch also. After that, he went to Jerusalem to face this council. This council. Uh, th there was a council of elders in Jerusalem. This council that... Um, uh, that had given him even letters to go and um, uh, persecute the Christian. Paul went before them again and went to testify how God, how he was preaching to the Gentiles and the Jews and how God is a savior of both Gentiles and Jews. And he was defending the Gentiles and saying it is not a must that Gentiles must be circumcised for them to be uh, born again. Salvation is by faith. So he went again to give his defense there. Then he went on his second, second uh, missionary journey that was in Antioch again. Then after that, he went in on his third missionary journey. He uh, he went back to Jerusalem, and that is where he was arrested, and he was taken to Caesarea as a prisoner. Then finally he went to Rome, and uh, some scholars say that he had his fourth missionary journey, and in this, his fourth missionary journey, after he was under house arrest in Roman, that is when he was beheaded, and he died as a martyr. He died for Jesus Christ. And something very powerful about Apostle Paul is that this is the man who wrote the 13 letters in the New Testament. And something amazing is that uh, this man of God wrote for about um, seven letters while in prison. You can imagine. God called him and he didn't disobey the calling of God. He went and he did exploits and God backed him up. 
the presence of God was with him. It is a lot that Paul had done and we cannot discuss today. But he went. He obeyed the calling of the Lord and he went. And as he went to preach this gospel, it was not easy. It was not easy. Paul faced a lot of opposition and a lot of challenges. And we will uh, see some of them. You can see uh, as projected. But I want to read to you what is written in the Bible about the challenges uh, th that Paul went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16 to 29. These are just part of uh, Paul's sufferings. He says, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. But if you do, then receive me just as you will a fool, so that I may do little boasting. In this self-confidence boasting, I am not talking as the Lord will, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I do, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or take advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we, we were too weak for that. What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So I am. Are they Israelites? So, I, so am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of, a, am I out of my mind to talk like this? I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequent, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from the false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone with I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been, I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my, uh, I pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Praise the Lord. That is part of the suffering that Paul went through. As you see highlighted, the gospel was not easy for Paul to spread. It was not easy. It was not easy, as we may think. He went through many things. And at some point, he told God, remove this thorn in the flesh. He had a thorn in the flesh. Many of us who have a heart, a flesh that is paining, you know how painful the flesh can be. It is very painful. This man says, I had, I have a thorn in the flesh. And when he prays to God to remove the thorn in the flesh, God tells him, my grace is sufficient. It is really painful to have a thorn in the flesh. For sometimes, like uh, three months, I have had my legs paining in the, on, in the heel down there. It is like when I step down, 
I'm stepping on um, on thorns and I've been on very strong painkillers. In fact, when the painkillers uh, gets out of my body, I can't stand before you. It is be, I, I go through a lot of pain. So I was just imagining if Paul had this thorn in the flesh throughout preaching and maybe during his days he never had any painkiller and this is the man who went all over all those regions preaching the word of God not only preaching but also writing letters to churches that is how this man how far this man went in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to see how he overcame the challenges. How did Paul overcome these challenges? Paul was a prayerful man. In Philippians 4, chapter 6, he says, Philippians 4, chapter 6, he says, Be anxious for, do not be anxious for anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. He was a prayerful man. One, for us to spread this gospel, we must be prayerful. I've never seen a man or a woman who have been successful in the ministry without prayers. This man was a man who read and reading and doing the word of God in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When he talks about who needeth not to be ashamed, it means that you preach what you do. You preach what you do. So reading and doing the word of God is mandatory for us to move this gospel forward. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he, say, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the rest. I have kept the faith. Serving God is a spiritual battle that is fought on our knees. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We are in a spiritual battle. We cannot serve God without uh, being on our knees. It is a spiritual battle. And this is how Paul was able to overcome his challenges. He prayed, he read, and did the word of God. Praise the Lord. And someone has said, truth doesn't change life. This is Reverend Chan. He says, truth doesn't change life. It is truth applied that it changes life. That means reading the word of God alone without applying it will not change your life. It is reading and doing the word of God that will change your life. Amen. As I conclude, I want to say our mission. Our mission is to know God and to make him known through evangelism and discipleship. So, we have programs in the church to assist us as our members to know God. We have the safari. Those of us who have been here for some time, you know the safari is an intentional discipleship program for SITAM to uh, the members. The safari is there for us. We have our membership class. You go to our membership class, you will get to know God. Then we have safari cohorts. The safari cohorts, we always announce that we are having cohorts. Register in those cohorts and uh, continue uh, to study, to know the word of God. We have our safari group, the SGs, the safari groups in every locality. And today we are relaunching our safari groups. Uh, and in these safari groups, when you go, you learn the word of God at least once a week. And you are able to learn together as a church. And that is why we are relaunching today and we are saying, all of us, if you know you are not in a safari group, kindly register to be in a, a safari group. That is where you will get to know God. We have affinity groups like the women ministry, the men's fellowship, the first ministry. Uh, first is about families, the young professionals, the singles ministry, the golden ages ministries. This ministry will help you also to know God uh, as you prepare to make him 
known. Praise the Lord. Then, of course, we have our Sunday service where we come every Sunday um, and learn about God. We have our Wednesday prayer service. We have our uh, uh, fast watch service. And we are inviting you for all these services. That is where you will get to know God. Then we have the vision of our church. Our vision is a community of impacting the world. Yeah, I know we have been saying it, but we want to actualize our vision and mission. Uh, our uh, vision, where we have uh, to begin actualizing our vision is actually in our homes. In our homes, evangelizing our family members, our siblings, our children, our spouses. We begin there. Then we come to church. When we come to church, we have what we call the service ministries. The service ministry is what you are seeing some people do here. We have the ushering ministry. We have music ministry. We have the, uh, the, the, the drama ministry. We have the Sunday school um, uh, teachers. We have the uh, young professionals and the youth ministry in the church here. Then uh, apart from the church, we have um, other ministries that we do outside. We have PPI, pastoral program of um, um, uh, past the pastoral program that we do in our primary schools and we call upon people to come and uh, help us. We do ministry. We have that avenue. We have schools where we do PPI for only uh, around 30 minutes or 20 minutes just to impact the next generation. Don't be comfortable here uh, saying I bring my child to church. If the other child of your neighbor is not evangelized, your child is not safe. Then we have the high school uh, ministries, we have colleges, universities, we have hospitals. People are sick in hospitals. We have prison ministry, orphanages, we have rehabilitation centers around, corporate organization, we have the social media. What are we doing even with that? Those are avenues for us to uh, actualize our vision. Then the Lord said that Lord Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Praise the Lord. 